If you've got this far, you're probably curious about the strange title of this video. The Blind Bus Driver. Having heard so much from the atheists I talked to about how Dawkins thoroughly refuted the irreducible complexity difficulties evolution faces, in his documentary The Blind Watchmaker, I decided to watch his documentary for myself so I could better discuss it with those I talked to. Now, perhaps it's because atheists put the blind watchmaker on such a high pedestal and raised my expectations, but I found Dawkins' documentary distinctly disappointing. I had expected sound, professional, scientific reasoning based on a firm foundation of factual reality. Instead, I found a rather amateurish and unprofessional propaganda-style effort at trying to hide the scientific difficulties behind a very weak wall of what amounts to little more than scientific-sounding waffle. There is a vast difference between a simple explanation and a simplistic explanation. A simple explanation endeavours to explain the complexities of a matter in a way that makes the complexities more appreciable and understandable. A simplistic explanation, however, merely pretends that the complexities do not exist at all. The explanations offered in Dawkins' videos are very simplistic indeed. Were it anybody else, I would put it down to a naive lack of understanding of the complexities involved. But even though Dawkins is much younger in the video, a person worth their science degree has no excuse for being unaware of the complexities involved in their chosen area of study. The arguments Dawkins makes are full of holes big enough that even a blind bus driver could easily drive through them. Hence the title of this video as we drive the bus of rational logic and factual reality through just a few of them. Now, I'm not sure why Dawkins would start his video with something that has nothing to do with it, but the intent seems to be to instill in his followers an inexplicable urgency that evolution is a concept that must be constantly and vigorously defended at all times. But surely it's the job of science to explore, examine, question and test theories to see if they are true or not and to see whether or not they accord with reality. It is not the task of science to defend theories but quite the opposite. Science is about challenging theories to see whether or not they are true. A theory that cannot defend itself is a theory that deserves to be scrapped. True science tests theories to destruction. It does not defend them. Now, perhaps it is an unkind thought, but one cannot help but wonder sometimes if the constant call to atheists to put every thought into defending evolution is to leave them with no thoughts left to question and challenge evolution theory for themselves to see if it is actually true or not. But, like Dawkins, let us also stop by the little town of Glenrose and the Paluxy River before moving into the real topic of his video. Ignoring the obvious sarcastic overtones, the first thing we notice is that Dawkins gives the impression that the case for dinosaurs coexisting with man in recent times rests entirely on the fossilised footprints from the Paluxy River. The truth is, they hardly rate a mention in the scheme of things. There is a mountain of far more convincing and inescapable evidence supporting the case than a few currently inconclusive footprints in a rock. All around the world, from a quite large and diverse range of ancient civilizations and primitive cultures, we find hundreds of written accounts, pictures, carvings and statues depicting the very same dinosaurs 
science is only now reconstructing and identifying. There is only one plausible way these many hundreds of quite genuinely ancient artefacts can all happen to depict the very dinosaurs modern science is only now being able to describe by high-tech painstaking reconstruction. And that is that these ancient civilizations and primitive cultures from all over the world were quite familiar with how dinosaurs looked and how they behaved. And that means that living dinosaurs were commonly observable sometime within the living memory of man. In other words, in geologically recent times, man and dinosaurs coexisted and interacted. Now, sadly, the over-exuberance of some ardent anti-creationists defending evolution theory at any cost, and the equally over-exuberant actions of some ardent creationists overly eager to defend creation, have so muddied the waters of the Paluxy that nobody who values their scientific reputation will now seriously investigate further. But that does not mean that we cannot critically analyse Dawkins' arguments why evolution has in any way been successfully defended in the case of the Paluxy River fossils. The first thing that is most important to understand in all of these types of scientific and quasi-scientific arguments is something that Dawkins and nearly all atheists seem oddly unable to grasp. It is this, that an alternative explanation in no way disproves the original explanation. Rather, they all remain simply alternative explanations, alternative theories that may or may not be true. Each and every alternative explanation or theory must still, in its own right, face the ultimate test of truth, and that is, how do they measure up to reality, and how much do they agree with it or are contrary to it? There is simply no point comparing creation theory and evolution theory together. Both must be compared to the same reality to see which one is true and which one is not. Now all Dawkins did with the Paluxy River fossils is offer an alternative theory as to how they might have occurred. He in no way disproved the original theory. But what constantly amazes me is how so many will accept the most incredulous, implausible and improbable alternative explanations in their endeavour to maintain and defend a belief in evolution theory. This one is a perfect example, but first let's make a few observations on the investigation itself that led to this alternative explanation. Dawkins introduces two supposedly independent young researchers who paddle about in the river with no more scientific equipment than a handbrush and an underwater viewing box. An earlier investigator, Carl Barr, is heavily criticised by evolutionists for being very amateurish and careless in his scientific approach. But compared to what we see of these two investigators, in this documentary, Barr was a highly accomplished professional scientist by comparison. At least Barr and Stan Taylor made the effort to uncover pristine fossils not totally disfigured by years of erosion and who knows how much human interference. Even Roland Bird excavated his fossils from under protective layers as any competent scientist would. But these two investigators could hardly be described as independent when their openly declared aim and motivation is not to find the truth, whatever it may be, but to attack and discredit creationism in order to defend and promote evolutionism in the educational indoctrination of young minds. Now, these two investigators surface again at the end of the video to declare they have solved the riddle of the strange tracks. 
that they had to invent an alternative theory to explain why they do not look like dinosaur tracks is in itself an admission that they do not look like dinosaur tracks. At this point Dawkins and company sling off at the silly creationists who could not see the obvious alternative explanation. However, they have fallen into that common trap of thinking that because they have been able to invent an alternative explanation, the case is closed and their explanation is naturally the right one. But let's have a closer look at this alternative explanation that they have come up with. The footprints are elongated and do not show any clear impression of the three toes at the front, whereas the normal footprint of a bipedal dinosaur show only the three toes, because bipedal dinosaurs walk on their toes and not their heels, which are actually well up on their legs somewhere. The alternative explanation being offered by the defenders of evolution is that a bipedal dinosaur that is designed to walk like this suddenly decided to walk like this. Now you will note that I've had to do a bit of cut and paste to show what is being suggested. This is because nobody has been silly enough to try and realistically depict a bipedal dinosaur struggling to walk on its heels. To give you some idea of how desperately far-fetched this alternative explanation is, we should note that these dinosaurs share the same basic leg structure as modern birds and the hind leg structure of many modern mammals such as dogs, cats, cows, horses, deer, antelope, etc. Their heels are a joint that is nearly halfway up their leg. Try imagining a dog or cat, cow, horse, antelope or a bird trying to stride along with its heels on the ground and trying not to put any weight on its toes. It is an anatomical impossibility for them. At best they can only shuffle along, leaving drag marks, not footprints, especially if they have a large tail dragging heavily behind them that is trying to stop them from falling over backwards. At worst, they will simply fall over. Their legs are just not designed to walk like that. To leave no clear toe prints, they would have to walk totally flat-footed. But if you have ever noticed a dog or cat crawling along, you will soon note they cannot lift their foot without levering it up by putting all the weight on their toes. Even when they rest on their heels, they cannot get up or down without at some point putting their full weight on their toes. So whether walking or resting, the most prominent and deepest feature of their footprint will still be their three toes. So the brilliant alternative explanation of evolutionism is that the dinosaurs decided for no apparent reason to walk in a way that was anatomically impossible for them to do. I'll leave you to judge how desperate some are to defend the theory of evolution at any cost. Just a very interesting footnote to the Paluxy River issue before we go on. One of those so-called independent investigators Dawkins introduces is Mr. Glenn Cuban, who claims to be independent and neutral in the matter, but whose words and actions are very much those of an ardent anti-creationist. I note that rather than succumbing to and admitting defeat before the investigations of Mr. Cuban, in his article, The Paluxy River Mystery, Dr. John D. Morris, PhD, makes some very astute observations that throw a very heavy cloud over the evidence that Mr. Cuban relies on 
for his conclusions. The article ends with the following puzzling observations by Dr. John Morris. The stain surrounding the prints has evidently increased over the past few years. It was first noticed in 1982 by Mr. Glenn Cuban, who since 1980 has been researching the area. At the invitation of Cuban, Paul Taylor, Marion Taylor and Marvin Herman, all associated with the production of Footprints in Stone, uh, Tom Henderson, early footprint investigator and this author, returned to Paluxy in October 1985 to see the new evidence. Some of us have returned since to do additional fieldwork. With the exception of Kuban, who claims neutrality on the creation evolution question, all share the conclusion that the recent reddish stain, so devastating to the original interpretation, is itself quite baffling as to source and meaning. The following additional mysterious points seem significant. Fifteen years of erosion, contrary to the usual effects of erosion, seem to have, inverted commas, improved the quality of the trackways. It is possible that a thin overlaying layer is eroding revealing an underlying print, but then why didn't the adjacent deep dinosaur trail receive this infilling material, since it was evidently made first? Since the marl which filled the deep dinosaur tracks was unconsolidated and easily removed by investigators, why did the Taylor tracks retain much of the material? while providing a solid print bottom and flush toes. If the reddish stain is due to minerals in the river water, why did the Riles Trail, which has been exposed at least 60 years, begin to stain at the same time as the more recently exposed prints? Applying a reddish stain to a rock surface can easily be accomplished by the application of certain readily available chemical agents. Is the giant trail extension valid? Likewise, are the tridactyl prints in the turnage trail really part of that trail? How could the old timers all be so wrong about the tracks removed from the Riles Trail? Why do the cores not show unequivocal evidence of toe infilling if the red surface stain is indeed a chemical alteration of an infilling material? Some very interesting observations. But just before we move on to part two of this video, where we deal with Dawkins' actual blind watchmaker arguments, I might finish this section with an observation of my own. One of the first and most famous hoaxes by evolutionists involving fossils was the Piltdown Man hoax of 1912. It took them 40 years of believing before it was revealed to be a hoax in 1953. But Piltdown Man is not the only hoax and fraud to be perpetrated by evolutionists. It is safe to say that by far the majority of scientific hoaxes, frauds and simple errors of eager wishful thinking have been by those with a fixated belief in evolution theory and its need to be vigorously defended at all times. Dawkins makes much of a scene from Shakespeare's Hamlet about seeing shapes in clouds. Indeed, we find in his video the sentence, methinks it looks like a weasel, popping up very much like a weasel all over the place. But methinks, 
From the evidence of all the hoaxes, frauds and errors of wishful thinking by evolutionism over the last 100 years that evolutionists are seeing missing links and the non-existent evidence of evolution in every passing cloud, regardless of what shape it is.